Thanks for watching. People have been asking me on email and also putting in the comments to the other videos, hey, when are you going to review the plane mate or just asking me to do a review of the Tour Striker plane mate. So this is it, I have it. So we'll do it a little bit backwards. I'm gonna give you the, the, the rating and the review first, and then I'm gonna give you the background and then tell you really how I'm putting it in, into use. So first of all, what is the plane mate and what will you get if you order this thing? So what it is is a belt. See this sliding rod on here and you wear it real nice and low. About 80% of the people I see on Instagram and other places who wear this thing, uh, they put it up around like their belly or something. You wanna like down like on your hips, like low. And then it's got a little connection here that you put on your golf club. And then you put that on your golf club, you click it on here like this. And that, this is the basic motion of what you do. Okay, so you can see how, see how this slides really nicely here and it, as it connects to this club. So the first thing I can say about it is it's not junk, it's really well made. This is like heavy metal, really sewn together, nice, the belt and stuff, like it doesn't like fall apart immediately or anything like that. Like it is really nicely made. It comes with three different cords. See these two are the same length, just different strongness. So this, this one that I have on here, the shorter one would be for the chipping setting. And then you would put this thing down lower and then you would use it for the full swing setting. So that's what you get with the Playmate. There's some, there's some videos on how to use it. I think from the ones I, I saw anyway, they could be more clear about how to use it. It was actually another YouTuber that had the best video on how to train with this thing. So they have a seven day protocol where the day one, you're just going from impact to finish and you're just getting this feeling of togetherness. Then you start to, to do some kind of chipping motion and you kind of progress up to like, finally then you're doing some full swings. In the literature or in the videos, they really want you to, to take your time, go really slow and, and really get this small motion right before you start building it up. Like, I guess their idea is kind of like building a house. It's a foundation and then you start building on top of that and once you've mastered one thing, you've gone on to another step. All right, my overall review and then we'll get into why. My overall rating for this thing, if you use it the way they tell you to use it, I would give it like a three, maybe like a 2.75 out of five. So uh, better than totally average, but um, also it's not like, not in the, the hall of fame of training aids. There are a lot of people who really love this uh, training aid, have, have really espouted some um, strong belief in what it does. but. Uh, we're going to get into what I, the deeper part of what I think about it. Let's first talk about Anthony. So Anthony, this is uh, Anthony's plane mate that he's let me borrow for uh, the last three weeks while I've been using it. Anthony got this plane mate and he, he religiously did the protocol. He did the, the seven days in a row as he was supposed to, um, was disciplined about not hitting balls too soon. Uh, you know, of course, the first thing you do when you, when you, take, it, when you take it out, you want to just start hitting full-on shots right away, you know, and uh, Anthony was very disciplined. He did it like by the book, exactly how they tell you to do it. And uh, Anthony, his review of it, he really likes it. Now, he would probably give it more like a 4.25 out of 5. Uh, Anthony really liked it. And uh, I will say that like a month after getting this, or maybe even like three weeks after getting this, Anthony did see like a big jump. He had, he had like the best uh, golf performance of his life. This thing called the Granada Hills Open, he shot a 67 and won the, t won the tournament by like uh, multiple shots. It was the first time he ever won like an amateur tournament. And he, he thinks that the plane mate had something to do with it because it was, he had done the protocol and then he'd also practice and put this away for a little while. But he thinks some of what the plane mate had done for him was staying in his swing. I love training aids. Talking about them in general, I really started to think, well, why do some work well? Why do others not work at all? Or why do some like, you know, actually make you go backwards or get worse? So we're gonna talk about training aids. The, the, the last month, no, not the last month, the last like two and a half months, I've been getting super big into uh, motor learning research. So on, the, on this channel, Be Better Golf, we talk a lot about, there's two, there's two ways to think about golf. There's one side of it would be what happens. So things like the, uh, the ground force, 
the the way the club's moving, the shallowing of the club, the uh, the club head speed, the result. Those are all things that are happening. Now, and that's basically 90 plus percent of uh, golf technology and stuff gives you better keys into the analysis of what happened with that shot you just hit. And then I guess the hope is that you can take that and uh, take that information and make changes, I guess. Then the other half of it is what to do. So there's what, hap what happened and what to do. And the entire part of what to do would be the motor learning. This whole, I've been reading dozens and dozens of papers on motor learning of just general skills and then also specifically about golf. So my friend Tony Lutzak, who, who just, uh, congratulations, uh, defended his dissertation and now he's gonna be Dr. Tony Lutzak uh, from Mississippi State. He did a review for me of like uh, hundreds of different papers and picked out some uh, papers that he wanted me to read about motor learning and also about golf. And in that stack, I came, I came across this one that he had gotten that specifically talked about guidance. So what guidance is, is when you're learning something and there's a device or a coach or something that's bringing you back to uh, the correct path. So if I take this, this off for a second. So the correct path, let's, let's just assume that the correct path is right like this, okay? So guidance would be something that, say, say you're over here, it would, it would correct you and get you back here. Or say you're under here, it would correct you and get you back here. Training aids all kind of come under this category of guidance. I'm gonna read this article because it, it clues you in not only on training aids, not only on the tour striker, but really on what you can do to get better at golf. This is a, uh, something that was published in 2014 in the International Journal of Golf Science. This is uh, Timothy Lee from McMaster University and Richard Smith from Human Performance Research. So now I'm gonna get into this paper, right to the section that's called uh, about guidance. And they have a couple pages about this. It's gonna be me reading some stuff, but it's gonna be, it's absolutely fascinating to see a lot of this stuff has been studied already. Just nobody's putting the stuff that's been studied and what the science says into action. I don't see any coaches, really, other than maybe, other than a few, like putting it into action with their students. Rather, I see a lot of golf coaches doing what other golf coaches have done, especially like the successful golf coaches have done. So let's get into it. Talking about guidance and uh, training aids and also getting better at golf. All right, so here goes, guidance research. Consider the multitude of training aids that are advertised on television. In golf magazines and the internet, some are simple inexpensive pieces of wood or plastic, whereas others involve very sophisticated and expensive computerized technology. A common feature among many of these aids is they are designed to provide corrective, sometimes physically restrictive feedback as instantaneously as possible after an error occurs. We suspect that most of these training aids are very effective during practice, i.e. they have a performance effect, but do they result in effective learning? A study by Armstrong illustrates how physical guidance can impact motor performance and retention. So that's critically important. It's not just the performance of when you're using it. That would be actually pretty low on how, how much that'll help you because you're not allowed to use it you know, on the golf course. But the retention would be the critically important part. So that's where we're getting into. The learner's task was to produce a horizontal arm movement according to a prescribed spatial and temporal pattern, which in some ways is similar to learning a golf swing. Participants practiced the task for 75 trials on each of three consecutive days. He tested three methods of delivering this information. One group of learners was providing, provided haptic which is senses, sensations that contribute to touch, from a computer-driven torque motor to assist in producing the movement. Essentially, this group was physically guided to produce correct movements on each trial over a three-day practice period. Another group of learners was presented a visual representation of the prescribed directional temporal information on a computer monitor, together with feedback, trace the action as the movement was unfolding. So that would be a lot like taking a golf lesson where um, you can see yourself on a monitor or the coach is telling you 
where you went. So this type of feedback is usually called concurrent feedback. A third control group of learners was provided only a quantitative summary of the error accumulated after each trial. So they did it and they said, okay, you were off by this much or that much afterwards. As expected, the guidance group performed essentially perfect repetitions of the pattern on each trial, which is illustrated in the figure in very small amounts of error when comparing the produced movement to the target movement. The concurrent feedback group, this is the group that was watching what they were doing as they were doing it, also performed very well, although they never achieved the level of accuracy as the individuals who were physically guided during practice. The least accurate performance was found for the group that received only error feedback after e each trial. This latter group was the slowest to improve and only at the end of the third session did they achieve the level of performance that the concurrent feedback group achieved almost immediately. And then uh, the right side of figure four shows the retention test trials performed by all three groups conducted immediately after the third practice session. All groups were treated the same way in these test trials with no guidance, visual feedback, or post movement. As is evident in the figure, the performance of both of these, of both the guidance and concurrent feedback groups was degraded dramatically in these tests as compared with the earlier, earlier performance in the acquisition phase. Performance in these retention tests test trials suggest that these groups had actually learned essentially nothing at all in terms of producing the action. Okay? So let me just talk about that just for a second. So the group that was guided into making these perfect motions and the results during the test were better. But then after the test and then after a little time is, had gone by and then they had to do it by themselves, it showed they had learned nothing at all they had completely so if they were if this was important to them learning this arm movement this would have been a complete waste of time the poor performance of the physical guidance group is certainly damaging to a view that promotes the advantages of errorless practice okay they learned nothing they had their retention was zero sometimes less than zero in this test Damaging to the view that promotes the advantages of errorless practice and potential advantages of physical guidance devices in general. Indeed, these types of findings have been replicated in, often in motor learning experiments. Based on these results, one should not expect such guidance techniques to be very effective for learning golf. Basically, what they did in that test is a lot like what goes on in the plane mate. A perfect, the plane mate Basically, the plane is here, right? We know that from Dr. Kwan's research at Texas Women's University and other stuff, that the plane, and I'll take this thing off for a second, the functional swing plane, which is basically people have all different kinds of swings. They're all, you know, all different kinds of spaces, but there is very little difference in all the best pros between hip high or even maybe like when the club gets to parallel here through the ball and when the club gets to parallel on this side, as far as the plane goes. Very, very little difference of what they're doing. Even less difference when you talk about the impact that, that pros are making. Basically, the, the, the plane mate that I have here, the, the Tour Striker plane mate, for full swings is guiding you back to this plane. See how this line runs kind of through my hip here? There's a great book about this called Decoding this, the Golf Swing Plane that the author sent to me. So this is the, the plane. So so a, a truly one plane swing could only go to about here because your elbow has to bend it has to come up above this so see how the plane would be there now here so every good golfer has got to learn at some point how am i going to get it back on what i call the functional swing plane through so this device is basically giving you guidance like we saw in that test so you can make a more perfect motion or it's going to guide you back there so certainly when you start going into full swing with this see that's a great shot i mean it was really a good shot very straight and everything which be, be, would be a lot like that test they said so we we see on that graph they're making kind of many many more in practice errorless shots and in the reviews and and feedback i've heard from people uh you people get almost addicted to the the awesome crisp contact that they're getting using the plane mate and if you look at your swing while you're using it i mean it's, it's like 
a lot of the things that you would want to see. In my general re review of the Playmate, that's why I would actually give it a pretty good rating. I'll tell you more why. If you're only going to go to hip high back and through, let's say on like the first three days of the protocol, there are reasons why that this thing could, uh, could really help you in your backswing and maybe a little bit in, in the through. Um, but once you get above and it starts pulling you towards the plane, I don't, th I don't know if it would be detrimental to your swing. Maybe it would be, but it, 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 I don't think it's going to do that much for you. I think one of the reasons that this thing is so popular is because everyone is desperate right now to, uh, that's here and they're going like this. This thing is pulling you that way. So everybody's talking about shallowing the club and this is like, okay, well, when I wear the plane mate, I can feel I'm getting shallow. Finally, I can feel what I, what I want to do. But that type of training isn't supported by the research that's been done on how people learn things. All right, let's get into why, and, and let's get into the twist. So you can see here how much I've marked up this paper because this was the, uh, was the really exciting part. However, a recent notable twist to the guidance literature. So remember, guidance is how people are being guided into doing something correctly, okay? And we're just gonna assume that getting onto the functional swing plane is correct. Because a lot of people are saying, well, there is nothing correct about the golf swing. There's a thousand different teachers with a thousand different opinions. Let's just, for this argument, assume that getting on the functional swing plane and swinging through like every good player does, you know, down here, is what we wanna do. All right. However, a notable twist to the guidance literature was contributed by Jay Lee and Choi in 2010. Their subject learned three patterns of a pursuit uh, tracking task under different conditions of haptic interference. One group was provided haptic, haptic guidance, which was similar in essence to the Armstrong's guidance condition where it fixed it, except that the computer gradually became progressively less constraining with practice. The other two haptic conditions were designed to disturb or interfere with performance rather than to guide it. So like that's the opposite. So it's gonna disturb and interfere with what you're trying to do. In one condition, the computer made the learner's task more difficult as tracking performance became more accurate by applying a repulsive force resistance the other condition, a noise-like disturbance, which was introduced such that the attractions towards the target course and repulsions away from the course were introduced by the computer at random during practice. So there's one that's pulling you towards the correct thing, there's another that's pulling you away from the correct thing, and then a third that's kind of just randomly knocking you about as you're trying to learn. A fourth condition was the control group that received no haptic interference and they just practiced on their own. As expected, the guidance group performed with minimal error in the early trials and then gradually became more errorful as the constraints of the haptic guidance were pro progressively relaxed over trials. Okay, So basically the first group, they were being guided to do the perfect thing and then, and then those, the guidance of that was opened up more and more and more. In contrast, the repulsive disturbance conditions resulted in the most errorful performance than the noise-like disturbance condition in which the learner's limb was either randomly repelled away from the target or attracted towards it, kind of in a crazy fashion, performed similarly to the control group, so the people who had no haptic feedback. The same day and next day retention tests, similar to Armstrong, the guidance conditions resulted in the least skilled retention performance. So the people who were being guided to do what was right had the least amount of retention. They, this is repeated again and again and again, yet training aids keep coming out that kind of guide you to do the right thing. Why are those training aids popular? So one, it's attractive because it's getting them to look the way they want to look and it's getting their swing to look like it's improved in a way like, okay, this thing I've been fighting forever, look, I'm not over the top or I'm not this or that. And then, Two is while they're using the training aid, they start, their performance goes up. They have less error, errorful practice. There's less errors in their practice and their performance goes up. So while they're using it, they're hitting crisp shots. They start, you know, imagining like, man, all I, all I gotta do is bring this to the course. So simple. So the, here's where the scientific research 
and the studies are coming together with our anecdotal experience of what happens with training aids. We always feel like, man, like I got it when I'm using this, but then like it didn't stick. There was no, that's what I talk about with stickiness. I learned this thing, but it didn't stick. So that's what this great uh, study from 2012 is. What is really sticky? So let's get into, or so that's, that's the guidance group, the group that was being helped. The guidance conditions resulted in the least skilled retention performance despite the progressive relaxation of the guidance constraints over training trials. So even though that they started, they started with tight guidance that was really helping them and then they let it off, let it off, let it off and then they kind of let them freewheel it. But still, they didn't retain it. They weren't, they weren't good at this movement afterwards. Interestingly, the control and the two disturbance groups performed similarly in the immediate retention test, but it was the noise-like disturbance group that performed the most skillfully in the delayed retention test. So that's the following day, the group that was sometimes pushing towards the correct thing and sometimes pushing away from the correct thing kind of randomly and their brain was having to adjust to that. Those were the people that performed most skillfully the following day. Other studies have confirmed the positive influence on motor learning of assistive devices that generate error rather than reduce it. So w when you think of all the different training aids and, and things and, and even like myself on the channel, I've used so many noodles to come within a path and to, to help me correct myself into, into a path. All that is not nearly as effective as something that would be pushing towards the error. It, uh, Tony was telling me in motor learning, it's called feeding the error. So what it wants is it wants you to do the correction. If something's doing the correction for you, it's not helping you at all. You're not doing anything. If you're pushing me towards the correct thing, that's not, that's not helping. It is clear from the work just reviewed, plus the majority of findings in the literature, that guidance does not promote motor learning. In fact, guidance is more likely to lead to detrimental effects on learning compared with other conditions of practice. So they're saying you'd be better off just being a control group, practice on your own. Artificial assistance that provides ongoing support to help understand the control of these dynamics tends to impede rather than enhance learning. So this is muscle memory to a T. People talk about, hey, this is gonna get you on the right path or you're gonna swing in this corridor or whatever else and it's going to give you muscle memory to, okay, well, this is how we do it and you just have to repeat it. Well, first of all, the block practice thing is debunked. Second of all, going on a perfect path again and again, that impedes it. In contrast, enhanced effort Full practice, effortful, that means enhanced practice that is making the challenge even harder. Under active movement control conditions, noise and repulsive groups support retention when augmented forms of support such as guidance are no longer available. Making practice more difficult for the learner seems to have benefits within limits, of course, like you can't <laughs> make it like impossible. So basically, when, even though you, during your training you're, you're hitting it pure and uh, this thing is helping you and you're hitting it pure and you think that's going to carry, carry over, it will not. Training should be disturbed to be retained. This whole thing is a really complicated review of the Tor Striker. So what have I learned from that? That we just learned that effortful, not effortful, difficult, disturbed practice that pulls you towards the error is the thing that has been shown to make people a lot better in golf and not something that pulls you towards the correct thing. So I've created a way to use this that I think can be really helpful. Let's go do that now. Studies have confirmed the influence on motor learning of assistive devices that generate error rather than reduce it. So I, I thought, of, well, how can I use this, which clips on here, and get, pulls you back towards the functional swing plane. How can I use it in a different way? So then I started thinking and I went in my toolbox and so this is what I've been, this is the way I've been using the, the, the Tor Striker Playmate. 
So this is totally, it's going to pull me away from the functional swing plane. So now it's up to me to fight to get back onto it. And then there's a way that I use it that I can introduce some, some random element to it as well. So all I do is I go here and the thing is with this, it's, it's at an angle, this band is going to be at an angle that is not normal to your wrist. And I know everybody wants to get better at golf like yesterday, right? They already feel like they've wasted enough time. But this is, um, this is going to be pulling you at a kind of an awkward angle. So, and it's not going to do that much for you to like stand 10 feet away from the fence doing this. So just, uh, just have it kind of put like a normal kind of force that, that makes you put some corrective adjustment to it. So when I take my swing here, I, it's me having to, mm. I'm having to fight to get back onto plane. And if the research is right, I would say that this thing pulling you towards the error, pulling you away from the functional swing plane is going to do more for you than something that's pulling you towards the functional swing plane. But the, uh, the literature said it was a little bit better if you kind of randomly did it. So I've been actually flip flopping where I'm wearing the belt and I'm taking some swings where it's pulling me towards it, some, and then switching to this immediately, and then also taking a lot of swings without it. I think uh, it's, an, and that, that block practice thing just doesn't work. You doing seven days where, where you're, you're going through, doing all of one drill one day, all of another drill another day, that, that's just not how the brain works. You gotta always be transferring it into how to do it. The other thing that's the way to do this that introduces a bit of randomness is you take a normal swing or a swing where you're trying just to get it on plane. You can even hit it like here. I got, I got some foam balls there. You can even hit some balls. Then you stand with, with that. Now my left leg is this way and I'm still trying to get on plane here. And it feels even more different. It's very easy on the backswing, very tough on the way through. Now I'm standing this way, like I'm headed towards first base now. So it's tough on the backswing and easy on the way through. And that's kind of confusing my brain and making my brain do the work. If, it's, uh, if the device is helping you, it's kind of shutting off your brain and learning is not happening. It's, if it's fighting you, your brain needs to light up to be like, okay, well, what do I got to do? So then you have to spend a lot of time where, and that's a, one of the great things about this, just clip it off. Then when you take a swing without it, you can really feel where the plane is. You really can. It's a lot like the feeling when the thing you did as a kid where you push your arms against the wall hard as you can and then you walk out and then your arms are like floating. It's a lot like that. So then, I mean, if I was, do, if I was really training at this for a long time, I'd be spending a lot of time hitting shots in between doing this. And then I'd click it back on and I'd take a couple swings. Ooh. Really trying to confuse my brain as it tries to pull me away from the functional swing plane. And one of the things that they did that was really good with this is they designed a really fantastic way to keep this on the club. You can slide it down and, and keep it more on the head. So here I'm going to, oh, that's really tough. And then there, I'm really fighting to get it back on. And here I'm not fighting quite as much, not at all. Not really at all there. And here I'm quite, so always changing it gives it that bit of randomness. And especially concentrate on your transition because see here, if you, want to, if you are a golfer that wants to be shallow, the thing that pulls you into being shallow is not going to help you. Look, if I'm here, it's pulling me to want to be this way. So I got to pull it that way actively. And that's the thing that's lighting up the learning. And then you can mix in using the tour striker in the more traditional way. Oh, that's a weird feeling to go right from that to that. 
Then a couple swings regular. It's really confusing my brain and making me have to do the work of what's gonna get this back on plane. Finally back on. You can see that once you have it set up, it's it's pretty easy. I mean, I would love to do a study. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to participate. I'd love to do a study with golfers that could take like two weeks off of playing golf, like do no golf activity at all with the way they do these studies. And all you were doing is setting this up and going one, two, three, just a little protocol up and back of kind of this random error generating device and just have you do this for two weeks and see if you get see if you get better uh, objectively better you know in an actual study not like a, a marketing group Whew. all right thanks for watching everybody really complicated video but i think it's going to have a lot of value whenever you see a training aid or anything else especially like a lot of the computer stuff that let's say like uh, it shows you up oh, you're out of position you're out of position like uh, uh. it's the thing that generates the error that is going to pull that is going to make your brain and, and fights you that's going to make your brain fight back to what's correct thanks for watching everybody click the subscribe button see you later bye